Another really super useful tool is personas. How many of you have heard personas use them? Awesome. Okay, most of you. Personas are hypothetical. They're not real users, but we take all the research that we've done with users and then we create this example is great. If you take everybody's needs into one car, you get something nobody wants. <laughs> right? You get this jalopy. If you instead look at Marge, the mother of three, Jim, the construction worker, and Alessandro, the software engineer, you get three different cars. But the car that's good for Marge, the mother of three, is also good for a little league coach and for, you know, scoutmaster and for some construction workers and etc. Right? So, construction workers who do small projects <laughs> as opposed to big projects, right? So that's the specificity of picking a person really narrowly focusing on the different needs and actually creating this virtual hypothetical person that everybody can relate to. Now in your design meetings you're going, okay, uh, would that work for Jim? Would Marge understand that? Does she have the need for it? And so everybody on the team, you can take that to your marketing team, you can take it to development, and everybody then does the I'm not the user, what would she do? That's really, really key, and personas for that are fabulous. Here, this is a really good example. It was a real, real set of, uh, of personas for a hardware product. We have Extreme Ed, Cautious Carl, Businessman Brad, Mobile Mike, and Mainstream Mary. Some of them are anti-personas, okay? These are people who are going to be setting up and really like pushing their machines. Mary's probably, Mary actually, I, you can't tell from this because the persona is not here, but I'm just giving you sort of the, the very tip of her persona. But Mary has, uh, she's a, a nurse and she has a teenage son and she works a lot of hours and she doesn't have a lot of tolerance for technology. Okay, some of these are really like stereotypes. But sometimes that helps us in order to understand that profile. She's not going to be setting up and, and over, over running her machine, right? Um, she's probably going to have her son do some of the settings. So that would be the anti-persona. So we decide, okay, we're not going to design for Mary in that case. But understanding the, the breadth of your, how many personas, how different they are, it's, it's a whole science of, but I am not the user, this is the user, that really helps. So then we understand our personas, now we're ready to start building stuff. And depending on where we are in our design process, we in architecture we have these kind of prototypes. You know, from the back of, the, from a napkin to a 3D model to a physical model, maybe a 3D with shadows, and now finally we actually have the building. This is the, uh, I think the Los Angeles Concert Hall. Disney, Disney Hall. And then we have, in software, we have our early mock-ups, wireframes, and then we start getting higher and higher fidelity as we go. And the beautiful thing about this is that we have the one, ten, and a hundred dollar costs of making changes. When we early on, making all those changes on paper is really fast and easy. As soon as we start making some of those things and coding them and the backend systems and the databases and so on, the changes start to get really expensive. In the web space, it's not as bad. Yes, you can change the website. When you're sending those CDs out or your product or shipping your hardware, those changes become really, really painful. So the sooner we can get things early and the more we can learn about our users, the